We are now a couple of solid days into NHL free agent frenzy here for the 2024 offseason. Now, today we're going to take a look at all the moves and kind of analyze which teams did the best and the ones that did not so good. So today we're looking at the free agent frenzy winners and losers, in my opinion, coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, I'm going to give you my thoughts today on the winners and losers, so to speak, of the 2024 NHL free agent frenzy. Now, there's still some names out there, nothing too crazy. There's a probably a handful of players that could maybe get multi-year deals or you know a decent AAV, but for the most part, uh, we saw on the first day and then, of course, a bunch more on the second day. There's not a lot of big names left. We're still going to get a lot of uh, rookie contracts and you know some smaller uh, one-year depth deals, but uh, most of the big ones have, have been done. You're going to get the odd contract extension as well, but for the most part, the, the heavy work, the heavy loads have been, have been lifted here. And we're going to go over now today which ones I think did the teams that did the best and the teams that definitely did not. And in my opinion, the ones I have down as the, the losers or the not-so-good teams here at Free Agency, some of them were pretty brutal in my opinion. There's a couple of two that are in between. I don't really know where to put them. But uh, starting with the winners, it's fair to say that the Nashville Predators stole the show, stole the day. July 1st was Predators uh, you know, they were just taking all the players, and they signed Steven Stamkos, who leaves Tampa, Jonathan Marcheseau, who leaves the Golden Knights, Brady Shea, who leaves the Hurricanes, Scott Wedgwood comes over from the Stars. They resigned uh, Alex Carrier as well, who made it to free agency, but came back to the Nashville Predators. And some of these players are, you know, not super young, but they're still extremely productive. They're all winners. They're all champions, and I think they can help make Nashville. A much stronger team, a lot more stronger playoff teams, and at the same time, you know, maybe even a Western Conference contender. Now, they're going to have their hands full. These guys all make them better for sure, but, you know, you're still looking at the Oilers and the Avalanche and the Golden Knights and, you know, even Vancouver now. Like, they're all, even while I didn't mention Dallas, who won the, won the top team in the West last year, like, they're all really good teams. So, Nashville by no means is going to have a cakewalk they are definitely better and when it comes to free agency they definitely stole the show they get all the attention they get all the most of the big names and i think barry trotz is off to a flying start here with him his uh you know gm days of course he's only got about a year experience but he was making it look easy here like the nashville predators are a, a fun destination for players who want to go there and that makes a huge difference it really does uh, obviously the, the taxes make a play make a difference the destination the lifestyle everything comes with it Good job on Nashville. You definitely stole the show and are one of the big winners in free agency for 2024. Uh, next up, I'm going to look at the Boston Bruins. I think the Bruins and Don Sweeney uh, made some good deals. Elias Lindholm will uh, really solidify their center depth. Uh, you know, seven times seven contract, which I think for him is good. At one point, he was a 30 40 goal sc scorer. He, he's a shoot first centerman. Um, and if you get the right playmaking wingers with him, like he had with Goudreau and Kachuk in Calgary, uh, he can be really, really good. And he's one of the better two-way centers in the league as well. There are a few that are stronger than him, like I would obviously Barkov and probably Kopitar, but there's there's not a lot. He's probably top five, I'd say, for two-way centermen in the NHL. So he's not going to be Patrice Bergeron, but of all the guys that they could have been going after, I even, I've been saying they, for about a year now since Bergeron, Ron was going to retire that Lindholm would be their best choice at trying to replace him I mean you can't replace him but as close as you can get they also bring in Nikita Zadorov of course Lindholm and Zadorov were teammates in Calgary they both got traded to Vancouver now they're going to be teammates again with the Bruins uh big Zadorov is going to give you a big personality he's a big body likes to throw the big hits um you know it certainly will help add some size in that back end I mean they already have McAvoy Lindholm Carlo you know, now they add Big Zadorov back there. So, in all honesty, this Bruins team has just gotten tougher to play against and stronger defensively. They add Max Jones as well, who can give you a similar style of play. It's like he's a younger Pat Maroon, in my opinion. Um, you know, he's a big body, can play you know a fairly physical style, and be good along the boards and in the corners and stuff like that. So he'll be a, a bottom line, probably third, fourth line player, but. Uh, to me, it gives you the similar style of stuff that they were getting 
out of Maroon and some other guys that have been there before. So uh, overall, I think Don Sweeney did a great job for the Bruins. Uh, the, the Hurricanes did well. I mean, they, they started off not looking good. They lose Brady Shea. They lose, uh, lose Brett Pesci. You know, two big pillars from their back end. But then they bring in Shane Gossis, Baron, Sean Walker. And they might not have the same pedigree those other two guys have, but they got them for far less money. So from a cap perspective, they're making a lot less. I thought they got really good value deals on those players. And if those guys, they were not going to give Brady Shea $7 million. They weren't going to give Pesci around 6 Like, you know, uh, they just weren't going to go there. Uh, we know the Hurricanes can be a little bit stingy. They're not going to overpay for players. And, you know, they got themselves some good value deals to replace them. So as much as it sucks to lose some guys, I think they, they did it good with the circumstances. I thought the Oilers had a wicked day as well. Uh, they were able to retain a lot of their top UFA depth. And then on top of that, they added some interesting more depth scoring. Uh, they re-signed Connor Brown. They re-signed Adam Henrique. They re-signed Matthias Janmark. That third line really came together uh, in the last couple of rounds of the playoffs and was uh, remarkable for them. The penalty killing, the secondary scoring, um, it just was clicking at a high rate. So those three all coming back on short-term uh, fairly cheap deals, uh, you know, uh, were, were huge. Uh, they bring back Corey Perry for another year, who fit in well after he arrived there. And then they add Jeff Skinner, who was bought out in Buffalo, and Victor Arvidsson out of L.A., uh, who, of course, good buddies with Matias Ekholm from their Nashville days. Like, Skinner and Arvidsson is going to really add to their, their depth in the, up in the forward group. That, that's phen- a phenomenal ads. So I really like the Oilers. I think they're a really deep team. I still think we're going to see them probably make a move or two to free up some more room. Uh, it's a shame they lost Vinny DeHarnay. I didn't really like the Josh Brown signing. Uh, Josh Brown, analytically, is one of the worst players in the NHL. Um, he is, And he gave him three years. Uh, I would have I would have given that money to DeHarnay in a heartbeat. Um I mean, he's right shot and in similar size. Uh, other than that, DeHarnay is just a lot better player. That's probably the only missed up. So I, I didn't care for that. I don't know why they brought in Brown, but I still think we're going to maybe see either a Kulak or a CC, more likely CC uh, trade. They lost Fogel, which is fine. They bring in Arvidsson and Skinner, so they're in good shape. Um, overall, I just really like what the Oilers did there. New Jersey continued to get better as well, really solidifying their back end, adding Brett Pish, Pesci and Brendan Dillon. Uh, so last year they had a major injury to Dougie Hamilton and just relied upon the kids too much, and they just weren't ready for that level of uh, play. And they really, you know, their season was lost because of that back end. And goaltending, the goaltending really did them in too. Um, and, of course, they've solidified that with Markstrom and Allen. Now they bring in Pesci and Dillon. That team just continues to get better. And the contracts they gave them were reasonable as well. So, overall, I really like what the Devils did. The Canucks, I thought, had a good day. They were hoping for Gensel. They didn't get him. They turned their uh, attention to Jake DeBrusque. I mean, the DeBrusque trade. Our signing story is it's a good deal. It has a little bit of risk to it, but I think they're with what the options were available for a, uh, a scoring winger to add in their top six, he was definitely one of the better ones out there. So overall, I think they did the right thing. They bring in Vinny DeHarnay from, from Edmonton, who I was just talking about, and Danton Heinen. Uh, Derek Forbort comes in as another depth option on the back end, some more size. So they got between DeHarnay and Forbort, and they already had – uh, some size back there on the, on the blue line, but of course they lose Zadorov, but they bring in those guys. Uh, you throw in Tyler Myers in there, and they get they have some big uh, some big boys back there. So overall, the Canucks had a really good day. Ottawa didn't do a lot, but a couple of the deals they did do, I thought, were good to really solidify their middle part of the lineup with David Perron and Michael Amadio. Uh, they're both shorter term deals, not a ton of money, but they're both guys that can play. In Perron's case, you know he's been a Stanley Cup champion. Um, he plays with a lot of uh, a lot of oomph, you know. Like he's not afraid to be in, in the rough stuff. He goes in the corners, the board battles, just a lot of the little things. He, he knows how to play, how to win. Uh, good, good leadership that way. Um, you know, and Amadio is a pretty good two-way player who can give you 15 goals or so. That's kind of what he's averaged. So for those two guys, it'll probably be on your third line with uh, like David Perron with Ridley Gregg. Sounds like a really 
pain in the butt line to play against. So overall, like I said, they they didn't do a lot, but those signings were good, and they cut some of the depth uh, that weren't coming back, like Kelly and Brandstrom and those guys who found homes elsewhere. So uh, overall, I think they, they had a good day. Colorado had a good day. They brought in two of the uh, options, of Ottawa Cut and, and Kelly and Brandstrom. And you know what? If Ottawa could have considered their these contracts, maybe it works, but they, they both signed one-year deals under a million bucks. Uh, they weren't going to get that in Ottawa. Ottawa needed to upgrade their uh, options there. And, then, of course, Colorado found a creative way to bring back Jonathan Durant and just another one-year deal, cheap money. Uh, again, so he he could have had more money, more term elsewhere, but he wanted to be happy, and he wanted to continue playing with Nathan McKinnon and the Avalanche. He enjoyed himself there, and he prioritized that. So overall, I think the Avalanche didn't do a ton, but they had a good day. They didn't do anything stupid, which is a big part of of the free agency. Uh, the Maple Leafs are a team I don't know where to put them. I mean, I like the Domi signing; that one was really good. I do like the fact they brought in Chris Tanev. I just don't like how they structured the contract. Uh, all in all, the AAV of four and a half million is fine. I just don't know what the, the long term. Not real crazy about that. Oliver Ekman Larson, uh, that's debatable too. Um, we'll see because he's going to have a different role than he had with the Panthers. Uh, a lot of the, the later in the season and, and into the playoffs with Florida, he was running the power play. He's not going to get that chance in Toronto. So. I wonder if um, he'll probably be an okay player for them. I just wonder if the money will line up with the offensive production, given where he's going to slot in that lineup. But we'll see. They also bring in Anthony Stolarz from Florida. So two Florida players join the Leafs. Uh, I like Stolarz. He had a great season. My big concern, though, is they didn't bring in a goalie with more experience. Um, Obviously, they have Wall and Stolarz. Both have lots of potential. Neither one of them ever played a whole lot of games in a single season, though, uh, because they've both been goalies that have been chronically injured for their entire careers. Um, so Stolarz was able to stay healthy last year, but of course, you know he was um, he was he didn't play a lot. So obviously with Bobrovsky, he didn't get a ton of action, but he was one of the better goalies in limited play last year. So again, we'll see. I, I have no problem with the contract. I just thought maybe they should go for a goalie who's got a little bit more history with playing more games. But there wasn't a ton out there. They didn't really do anything bad. I just kind of wondered if it might have been some better better choices. Uh, on the losing side, though, teams that I was not fond of, uh, the first team I'm going to blast is the Seattle Kraken. I think uh, Chandler Stevenson and Brandon Montour are grossly overpaid. Chandler Stevenson got big money and big term. And to be honest, I don't know why. Like I said before, he's a good player. He plays with pace. He's a good skater. I don't see him putting up anywhere near the numbers he did production-wise that he did in Vegas. He got to play a lot with Mark Stone. Mark Stone makes everybody better. He's such a smart player. Um, I just think that they're going to regret that contract. This is going to be one of the ones I think. And I'll, and if I am wrong, I will, I will own it, and I will eat crow here on the channel. But... You know, the Steven Chandler Stevenson might turn out to be one of the biggest overpayments in free agency. Brandon Montour, I really like as a defenseman. I just don't know that he's capable. Uh, two years ago, he had like, I was at 70 points, and he was a huge part of the Panthers going to the final. This year, like, he's not the same guy. And he had a major shoulder injury. And I just don't know that he's the same player that he was. And he gets seven years at seven million bucks a year. He's, he's a, Really, he's not huge. He's a smaller guy, but he's very creative, really smart, uh, great offensively. But I just, I, to me, there's risk here because I just, I watched him a lot last year, and I just don't know that he's the same player anymore. I think that injury took a lot out of him. So we will see where it goes. I hope it works out. I just see those contracts of having more risk associated to it than what Seattle needed to take on. Uh, I don't see Ron Francis and the Kraken as being a team that's high risk anything. Uh, he's always been super safe, very conservative, and just surprised me to see those contracts handed out. Uh, Minnesota Wild give Jakob Trennan a multi year, three and a half million dollar deal uh, for somebody who's going to play near bottom six. To me, that's too much term for a bottom six player, too much money. Um, I know Minnesota didn't have an opportunity to do a ton of business. Uh, they don't have a lot of wiggle room, but I just I, I thought the trend I like Trenton as a player. I just thought it was too much term and too much money. 
The Los Angeles Kings, I don't know what the heck they were thinking. Signing Joel Edmondson, he gets four years, uh, well over three million bucks a year. It was a three and a half. Like that Joel Edmondson contract is atrocious. Uh, for one, he's not worth that money if he's healthy and playing good. And on top of that, he's hurt all the time and has a chronic back issue that he seems to continuously have issues with the last couple of years. I, I that's way too much, way too much risk for me on Joel Edmondson. They signed Warren Fogle. I don't mind that, but with if you look at what came out of their lineup with uh, Victor Arvidsson, obviously him and Fogle kind of swat swat swap places almost. Um, I just don't know if it really moves the needle any. LA is a team that's been kind of. You know, when no man's land for three consecutive years, they get in the playoffs and lose in the first round. Like you would think, they want to, you know, do something to get over the hump and get better. Uh, I don't know what they did. They trade up here, Luke Dubois, uh, for Darcy Kemper. They don't do much in free agency. And what they do do, I'm like, oh, that's too much term. What are you doing? I just, I really don't like that Joel Edmondson contract. Edmondson and Stevenson to me are probably the two worst contracts handed out on day one of free agency. Uh, I'm going to say the Buffalo Sabres are on the losing side here and had a horrible time. They haven't done anything much. Like, what is Kevin Adams doing? Like, this team last year in the offseason did practically nothing. They saw good progress and they did nothing. You would think they'd be encouraged and want to add to it to get them over the hump, make them better. You know, we saw uh, this year, like Detroit pass you know in detroit right up there now too like they're not the sabers aren't the only ones moving up in this division detroit did it too ottawa moved up some not as much as them they they did kind of step on their own toes here um but they're doing things now to get better again so like but buffalo is like detroit and ottawa for example just they've been active at least they're trying stuff and they're doing what they can to try to get better here but buffalo has just been so quiet they brought in james reimer like, okay, like I just, to me, that team needs to get better. And I just, I don't see much activity going on. And I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't know what, how you're going to get better with the same team. Um, so, yeah, so that, that to me just, I mean, they did add Jason Zucker. They did add Sam Lafferty, but it's just not, it's not much. They're short one year, you know, short term deals. They give Zucker $5 million, I think it was. Like, okay, that's too much again. Uh, it's just it's mind-boggling. Like, this team has missed the playoffs for so long, and they're so close. I just, why are they not doing something more significant? That's that's they, Apparently, they tried to get Marty Natchez, and he wouldn't sign. But we'll see where things go. But those are my teams that I feel that the best and the worst in free agency. I'd love to know what your thoughts are down in the comments. So let me know which teams were the best signings, which were some of the worst ones. Um, you know, gloat about the teams you thought did amazing. Blast the teams you thought that did poorly. And we'll talk about it in the comment section. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll be back and keep you up to date with all the news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching. I'll catch you next time.